the Noah Methodist Church is happy to produce a lot of different content for the edification of Christ Church throughout the world. This daily segment that you're listening to right now corresponds with the Daily Bible Reading Challenge, which is hosted by Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. If you want to download the list of readings that they publish for yourself or learn more about this challenge, this initiative, go to BibleReading.ChristKirk.com. I'm Jeffrey Rickman. I'm the pastor here in Nowata, and I read from the Berean Standard Bible, which you can also find at Berean.Bible. Consider subscribing to this podcast to be a part of this daily effort to grow in familiarity with and love of God's Holy Word. Let's dive in for today. Hey there. Glad you're joining me again to read through the scriptures a bit. Uh, Just in the setup for Joshua, what we've gone through so far is the Israelites are finally moving into the promised land. God has Bless them, prospered them in their efforts to take over the land, except for when they rebel, and that's when God turns against them. So time and time again, the lesson of obedience is being drilled into them. So we're going to pick up now in Joshua chapter 10. Let's attend upon God's Word together, shall we? Now, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were living near them. So Adoni Zedek and his people were greatly alarmed, because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and its men were mighty. <clears throat> Therefore, Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent word to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up and help me. We will attack Gibeon, because they have made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. So the five kings of the Amorites, the, king, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces and advanced with all their armies. They camped before Gibeon and made war against it. Then the men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come quickly and save us. Help us, because all the kings of the Amorites from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua and his whole army, including all the mighty men of valor, came from Gilgal. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not one of them shall stand against you. After marching all night from Gilgal, Joshua caught them by surprise. And the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great slaughter at Gibeon, pursued them along the ascent to Beth Haran, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makedah. As they fled before Israel along the descent from Beth Haran to Azekah, The Lord cast down on them large hailstones from the sky, and more of them were killed by the hailstones than by the swords of the Israelites. On the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still. And the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance upon its enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stopped in the middle of the day and delayed going down about a full day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord listened to the voice of a man because the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makedah, and Joshua was informed. The five kings had been found. They are hiding in the cave at Makedah. So Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and post men there to guard them. But you, do not stop there. Pursue your enemies and attack them from behind. Do not let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites continued to inflict a terrible slaughter until they had finished them off, and the remaining survivors retreated to the fortified cities. 
The whole army returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda, and no one dared to utter a word against the Israelites. Then Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought the kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had accompanied them, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So the commanders came forward and put their feet on their necks. Do not be afraid or discouraged, Joshua said. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord will do this to all the enemies you fight. After this, Joshua struck down and killed the kings, and he hung their bodies on five trees and left them there until evening. At sunset, Joshua ordered that they be taken down from the trees and thrown into the cave in which they had hidden. Then large stones were placed against the mouth of the cave, and the stones are there to this day. On that day, Joshua captured Makeda and put it to the sword along with its king. He devoted to destruction everyone in the city, leaving no survivors. So he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord also delivered that city and its king into the hand of Israel. And Joshua put all the people to the sword, leaving no survivors. And he did to the king of Libna as he had done to the king of Jericho. And Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. They laid siege to it and fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel. And Joshua captured it on the second day. He put all the people to the sword just as he had done to Libna. At that time Horam king of Gezer went to help Lachish. But Joshua struck him down along with his people, leaving no survivors. So Joshua moved on from Lachish to Eglon and all Israel with him. They laid siege to it and fought against it. That day they captured Eglon and put it to the sword, and Joshua devoted to destruction everyone in the city, just as he had done to Lachish. And Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Eglon to Hebron and fought against it. They captured it and put to the sword its king, all its villages, and all the people. Joshua left no survivors, just as he had done at Eglon, and he devoted to destruction Hebron and everyone in it. Finally, Joshua and all Israel with him turned toward Debir and fought against it. And they captured Debir, its king, and all its villages. They put them to the sword and devoted to destruction everyone in the city, leaving no survivors. Joshua did to Debir and its king as he had done to Hebron, and as he had done to Libna and its king. So Joshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, the Negev, the foothills, and the slopes, together with all their kings, leaving no survivors. He devoted to destruction everything that breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua conquered the area from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza, and the whole region of Goshen, as far as Gibeon. And because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel, Joshua captured all these kings and their land in one campaign. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Joshua chapter 11. Now when Jabin king of Hazor heard about these things, he sent word to Jobab king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Achshaph, to the kings of the north in the mountains in the Arabah south of Kinnereth, in the foothills and in Naphoth Dor to the west, to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites at the foot of Hermon in the land of Mitzpah. So these kings came out with all their armies, a multitude as numerous as the sand on the seashore, along with a great number of horses and chariots. All these kings joined forces and encamped at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, for by this time tomorrow I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn up their chariots. So by the waters of Merom, Joshua and his whole army came upon them suddenly and attacked them. And the Lord 
delivered them into the hand of Israel, who struck them down and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon and Mizraphoth Maim, and eastward as far as the valley of Mitzpah. They struck them down, leaving no survivors. Joshua treated them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned up their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword because Hazor was formerly the head of all these kingdoms. The Israelites put everyone in Hazor to the sword, devoting them to destruction. Nothing that breathed remained, and Joshua burned down Hazor itself. Joshua captured all these kings and their cities and put them to the sword. He devoted them to destruction as Moses the Lord's servant had commanded. Yet Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds, except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites took for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but they put all the people to the sword until they had completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone who breathed. As the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua. That is what Joshua did, leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So Joshua took his entire region, the hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel and their foothills. From Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, as far as Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon at the foot of Mount Hermon, he captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long period of time. No city made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites living in Gibeon. All the others were taken in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to engage Israel in battle, so that they would be set apart for destruction and would receive no mercy, being annihilated as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time Joshua proceeded to eliminate the Anakim from the hill country of Hebron, Debir, and Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction along with their cities. No Anakim were left in the land of the Israelites. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to the allotments to their tribes. Then the land had rest from war. Joshua chapter 12. Now these are the kings of the land whom the Israelites struck down and whose lands they took beyond the Jordan to the east from the Arnon Valley to Mount Hermon, including all the Arabah eastward. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, he ruled from Aror on the rim of the Arnon Valley along the middle of the valley up to the Jabbok River, the border of the Ammonites, that is, half of Gilead as well as the Arabah east of the Sea of Kinnereth to the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, eastward through Beth Jeshimoth, and southward toward the slopes of Pisgah. And Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Rephaim who lived in Ashtaroth and Edrei, he ruled over Mount Hermon, Salekah, all of Bashan up to the border of the Geshurites and Maacathites, and half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites had struck them down and given their land as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And these are the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered beyond the Jordan to the west, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which rises eastward toward which rises towards Seir, according to the allotment to the tribes of Israel, Joshua gave them as an inheritance to the hill country, the foothills, the Arabah, the slopes, the wilderness, and the Negev, the lands of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is near Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Gezer, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Geder, one. The king of Hormah, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Adullah, one. 
the king of Makedah, one, the king of Bethel, one, the king of Tapua, one, the king of Hefer, one, the king of Aphek, one, the king of Lash Lasharon, one, the king of Madon, one, the king of Hazor, one, the king of Shimron Meron, one, the king of Akshaf, one, the king of Ta'anak, one, the king of Megiddo, one, the king of Kedesh, one, the king of Jokneam in Carmel, one, the king of Dor in Naphath Dor, one, the king of Goyim in Gilgal, one, and the king of Tirzah, one. So there were thirty one kings in all. That concludes our time in Joshua. Now we go to the New Testament and Acts of the Apostles 10. We've seen the spread of the church through uh, the apostles and also through the deacons that were established and sent out, establishing proper theology of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and the power of God's Word. Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was called the Italian Regiment. He and all his household were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to the people and prayed to God regularly. One day at about the ninth hour, he had a clear vision of an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear and asked, What is it, Lord? The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to call for a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among his attendants. He explained what had happened and sent them to Joppa. The next day, at about the sixth hour, as the men were approaching the city on their journey, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth, as well as birds of the air. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter answered. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and all at once the sheet was taken back up into heaven. While Peter was puzzling over the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house and approached the gate. They called out to ask if Simon called Peter was staying there. As Peter continued to reflect on the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without hesitation, because I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you were looking for. Why have you come? Cornelius the centurion has sent us, they said. He is a righteous and God-fearing man with a good reputation among the whole Jewish nation. A holy angel instructed him to request your presence in his home so he could hear a message from you. So Peter invited them as his guests, and the next day he got ready and went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. The following day he arrived in Caesarea, where Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was about to enter, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet to worship him. But Peter helped him up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. As Peter talked with him, he went inside and found many people gathered together. He said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jew, a Jew to associate with a foreigner or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was invited, I came without objection. I asked then, Why have you sent for me? I asked then, yes. Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this, the ninth hour. Suddenly, a man in radiant clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa for Simon, 
who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and you were kind enough to come. Now then, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has instructed you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism, but welcomes those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. He has sent this message to the people of Israel, proclaiming the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You yourselves know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee with the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And although they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, God raised him up on the third day and caused him to be seen. Not by all the people, but by the witnesses God had chosen beforehand. By us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard his message. All the circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and exalting God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water to baptize these people? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. Acts chapter 11. The apostles and brothers throughout Judea soon heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers took issue with him and said, You visited uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained to them the whole sequence of events. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision of something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came right down to me. I looked at it closely and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, I said, for nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice spoke from heaven a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and everything was drawn back up into heaven. Just then three men sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to accompany them without hesitation. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's home. He told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will convey to you a message by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he had fallen upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, as he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to hinder the work of God? When they heard this, their objections were put to rest, and they glorified God, saying, So then, God has granted even to the Gentiles repentance unto life. Meanwhile, those scattered by the persecution that began with Stephen traveled along as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the message only to Jews. But some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. When news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to abide in the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. So for a 
full year they met together with the church and taught large numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted through the Spirit that a great famine would sweep across the whole world. This happened under Claudius. So the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders with Barnabas and Saul. Acts chapter 12. About that time, King Herod reached out to harm some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And seeing that this pleased the Jews, Herod proceeded to seize Peter during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He arrested him and put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was fervently praying to God for him. On the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, with sentries standing guard at the entrance to the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed and put on your sandals, said the angel. Peter did so, and the angel told him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. So Peter followed him out, but he was unaware that what the angel was doing was real. He thought he was only seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city, which opened for them by itself. When they had gone outside and walked the length of one block, the angel suddenly left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And when he had realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered together and were praying. He knocked at the outer gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she forgot to open the gate, but ran inside and announced, Peter is standing at the gate. You are out of your mind, they told her. But when she kept insisting it was so, they said, It must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astounded. Peter motioned with his hand for silence, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Send word to James and to the brothers, he said, and he left for another place. At daybreak, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had searched for him unsuccessfully, he examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. Now Herod was in a furious dispute with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they convened before him. Having secured the support of Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for a peace because their region depended on the king's country for food. On the appointed day, Herod donned his royal robes, sat on his throne, and addressed the people, and they began to shout, This is the voice of a god, not a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and multiply. When Barnabas and Saul had fulfilled their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, bringing them John, also called Mark. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We often wonder how it is that we got the church that we have today. Acts of the Apostles is the book to read to figure it out. We in the church today have a large heritage to carry, and it's not just from Jesus himself, but from the Holy Spirit who empowered the church originally in a great clear vision, how it is that we're supposed to live, witness to the world, minister to one another. So I hope you're drawing some of that strength, some of that ammunition even for doing spiritual battle to uh, revive the church of Jesus Christ, to faithfully participate in the church of Jesus Christ. Remember that Jesus himself built the church and he has commissioned 
the Holy Spirit. He has sent his Holy Spirit not only to comfort and advocate for us, but to guide us as we faithfully participate in the life and the work of the church. All right, I'll see you tomorrow.